The Norman and Florence Brody Family Foundation is dedicated to exploring topics of national and international importance and is proud to support Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff at the University of Maryland. From the University of Maryland, this is Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff. Iran, formerly known as Persia, has been a powerful political, military, and cultural force in the Middle East for more than two millennia, partly in response to Iran's growing modernization and westernization in the 20th century. The Islamic Revolution of 1979 deposed Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi and installed a new government led by religious clerics and based on Sharia law. The result was a tightly controlled, non-democratic state that has often oppressed its own people and threatened the West. Joining us to discuss the Iranian regime during the past 30 years is Michael Ledeen, Freedom Scholar at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies and author of Accomplice to Evil, Iran and the War Against the West. And now, the host of Policy Watch, Doug Besharov. Michael Ledeen. Welcome to Policy Watch and the University of Maryland. Thanks. Happy to be here. Now, you've recently written this chilling book, and it really is chilling. It's called Accomplice to Evil, Iran and the War Against the West. What do you mean by accomplice to evil? I mean that, uh, that we, by our failure to react to it in a timely way, have become, in essence, its partner. And evil being? evil being uh, the evil countries that do evil things to good people. Now this book is about Iran and the war against the West, but you actually start by thinking about other countries that have also been evil and that we've also ignored. Well, I'm a member of the generation that studied Nazism and fascism. My PhD goes back to the mid-1960s. And, and we plowed into the archives of the Nazi and fascist states and then later on into Soviet archives and so forth, trying to find out two things. First, how did it happen? And second, why didn't anybody do anything when it was so clear what was going on? Let, let's give our audience a little bit of Iranian background because I think we have a little misunderstanding. Okay, so the Shah of Iran was deposed in 1979. And I think the impression many people had is he was deposed because he was a tyrant there was lack of freedom in Iran, and the voices of freedom rose up for a new, modern Iran. Well, for a new Iran. So, and some of them wanted a modern Iran, and most all of them thought they were going to be freer under a new revolutionary government than they had been under the Shah. That, yes. But, however, the hardcore, the group around Khomeini, which eventually took power of the country, installed the Islamic Republic and so forth. They didn't want a modern Iran. They wanted a medieval Iran. They wanted to go back to the beginning. And in fact, the Shah was, and his father, were great modernizers. Yes. I mean, and that was part of what undercut uh, their uh, support among the clergy. Well, yes. I mean, look at, if you read Khomeini pre-revolution, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. what are the things that drive him crazy about the Shah? Above all, what drives him crazy is that he's good to women. And you got women teaching boys, and you have women in the government, and all, and he just rails against that, just hates that. What, uh, um, what is the special animus that the Arab or Muslim people have towards women? Well, it's in the Quran. I mean, it's a very, uh, I mean, it's in all the old religions, right? Jews, Christians also believed this for a very long time. Right, Jewish prayers in the morning begin, every Jewish man prays, gives thanks to God that he wasn't created a woman. Okay, well, we got smarter over time, right? <laughs> and that passed, you know, we got over that. They have never gotten over it. They are still where they were then. And, uh, and misogyny is really at the heart of contemporary Iran and at the heart of the Islamic Republic, as it is throughout the Muslim world, by and large, and I've often said, that if there's a revolutionary force in the Middle East, it's the women. They're scared to death of women. And one usually thinks that these are not just 
historical, I mean, I hate to be anti, secular, so secular, but just because it's written in the Quran doesn't necessarily mean that it gets followed. It must have a very practical purpose in these contemporary societies. Yeah, the practical purpose is that is that it keeps women in their place. Look, you know, the, the Nazis were, were adamant also about women in the home. Church, kitchen, children. That was one of the most famous of Hitler's slogans. And, and a lot of German women liked that, one has to say, unfortunately. I mean, it wouldn't work nowadays. But, I mean, that's 20th century. That's not ancient history. You know, uh, a, a lower class man if he has someone else to push around, may not feel so uncomfortable about his station in life. Yeah, but uh, Prussian generals, <laughs> you know, they get plenty of adulation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, SS leaders and Gestapo chiefs and so forth, they got plenty of hero worship. They didn't need that for that. Mm -hmm. So um, the, people, the people around Khomeini take charge. Was that predestined to happen? Uh, were they the ones who were going to get control in 1979, or was there a power struggle? Oh, there was a power struggle. There's always a power struggle. And how did they succeed? They were smarter than the others. They were more brutal than the others. They were more ruthless than the others. And then, for 30 years, we tried to ignore Iran. No. no. For 30 years, we've tried to make a deal with Iran. Okay. The deal has been? The deal was, and still is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you behave nicely. And we'll be very good for you. Mm -hmm. You know, we'll trade with you. We'll put money in there. We'll send American technology expertise and so on. We'll bring you into the highest levels of the councils of nations and so forth. Now, that seemed to be a pretty good deal for Vietnam. They seem to have come along after the war. Right. Why not Iran? Because Iran wants to destroy us. They're not interested in, in a deal. They want us dead or dominated. Us dead or dominated or just out of the Middle East? No, 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 dead or dominated. There's no ambiguity about this at all. They believe they're waging holy war against us. They've said it from the first minute. They've said it every single day. There's not a day goes by without some, some Iranian leader out there leading chants of death to America. Now, well, how do they intend to do that? Uh, all the, any way they can. I mean, at the moment, their basic tactic is terror. They, they are the leading sponsors of terror all over the world, everywhere all kinds of terrorist groups, doesn't matter. Shiite, Sunni, secular, atheist, the whole nine yards. Let's go, let, let's just talk about internal Iran for a little bit. And, and in, in your book you write a great deal about the place of women mm -hmm. and so forth, and we talked about that. It defines it, I think. T tell us a little bit more. Well, I mean, women, uh, women are worth half a man, according to law. So my, the most dramatic example I know is that if you're a pregnant woman and you get killed in an automobile accident mm -hmm. and the other party is found guilty, the other party has to pay your family a share and a half, one full share for the fetus if it was male mm -hmm. and half a share for you because you're a female. Women don't have private property. Women need permission from their husbands to travel. I mean, all kinds of things. They're just the subservience of women is written into the Iranian constitution and into Iranian law. And in these last 30 years, their economy has become quite weak. GDP mm. is down. Mm. Um, what's the explanation for that? <laughs> they're screw-ups. <laughs> I mean, they're very bad at running a country. And, uh, and a lot of the money I mean, there's the dark side of this it, also. There's very heavy corruption. I mean, part of this is... Yes, but there's corruption everywhere. So, I mean, there's lots of corruption all over the place. I mean, China's immensely corrupt, but GDP's rising and, you know, it's doing better and so forth. Iran has huge income. A huge part of that income gets spent on terrorism. Mm -hmm. An awful lot of it goes out to Hezbollah, Hamas, Islamic Jihad, Al-Qaeda, and so forth, and, and buying weapons. And they have their whole nuclear weapons project. That costs a lot of money. So, you know, money gets spent on things other than the greater good of the Iranian people. Now, I think you've written that oil is a curse to countries like Iran. It's a curse to all countries. I mean, all countries that are richly endowed with a natural resource that produces wealth without people having to create wealth on their own, no, no enterprise, no, 
no hard work, no good productivity, and so forth. All those countries are ruinous. These are many of these are Middle Eastern Arab countries, of course. It's yeah, Nigeria and yeah. so forth. Yeah. Uh, but I think I read that the efficiency of the Iranian oil fields is way down, and yes. so this is not as productive as it might be. No, it could be better. Could be a lot better. And you know, you read forecasts. It's hard to know what to make. I mean, data, Iranian data, are always suspect. Uh, you know, because where does it come from, and so forth. But I mean, there are people who say that you know, five years from now, uh, the Iranian oil business will be really bad, and very little income will come from it. I don't know if that's true. Expand a little bit more on on, on the Iranian. Implicate uh, involvement in terrorism. I mean, you gave a long list a moment ago, mm. but um, um, Hezbollah. Right, Hezbollah is a global terrorist organization. It was created by the office of the Prime Minister of the Islamic Republic of Iran, and it's run out of the Iranian government. Um, now, today, it, it's changed a bit internally. It's generally run by the Revolutionary Guards. It's an adjunct to the Revolutionary Guards. And uh, there are many famous cases of terrorists who were Revolutionary Guards, people who were killed fighting alongside Hezbollah, either in Lebanon or, uh, or elsewhere. And, uh, and their reach extends from the Middle East, which we all know about, to South America, for example, because uh, Hezbollah was, is indicted for blowing up uh, first the Israeli embassy and secondly a Jewish socialist welfare mm -hmm, center mm -hmm. in Buenos Aires in the 1990s. And so there you'll see their, their pictures in Interpol. You go to the Interpol website and you'll find all kinds of leading Iranians, including Hezbollah. Now, sometimes when people say, well, we should just go after the Iranians, the response is, well, they have these sleeper cells in the U.S. Yes. What's that all about? Uh, terrorist organizations have had sleeper cells in the United States for a long time. Back in the early and mid-1980s when I was in the government, and I did some work on this, we knew of various sleeper cells in the United States, the most famous of which was Abu Nidal, who was the chief, uh, the most dangerous terrorist in the world at that time. And we discovered that people had been infiltrated into the United States from the Middle East, mostly Palestinians. Well, it's quite easy to come in. Well, they, they were very good at it. They, they tended to go first to Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. marry a Puerto Rican woman, and then come together as a married couple into the United States where they did very, very ordinary things. They ran the equivalent of 7-Elevens. Some of them got good education, some of them became doctors, lawyers, dentists, so forth and so on, and they're all over the place. It's chilling, chilling. Yeah, and they were just simply waiting for orders, and they were all ready to go. So the, this emerged in a terrific story, if you have a minute. Yeah. In St. Louis, there was a guy who ran a convenience store, and he had done the whole Puerto Rico bit and so forth, and, and they had raised two teenage daughters. One of them uh, was a very modern uh, sort of girl, and she was dating a black man, black man. And the father was very upset by that, and he kept saying to her, don't do it, don't do it, you gotta stop, break up with this guy, and she didn't. And one night she came home late, and he stabbed her to death. And uh, stabbed her to death with her mother holding her hair down to the floor, and the father stabbing her saying, die, daughter, die. And we know all this because the house was bugged by the FBI and they taped the whole thing. So this guy then, you know, was arrested and uh, charged and so forth, but they didn't have enough evidence to convict him, and the FBI had a problem, because they knew that if they came forward with the evidence about this guy, which was absolutely 100%, uh, that they would thereby expose to the whole network the fact that they were onto the network and they were, they were listening to them all. And, uh, and they did that. They came forward, the tape was entered in court, the guy was convicted, and the, the mother was also convicted, and so forth. So, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of evidence. I mean, this isn't speculation. There's a lot of hard data. So you've been in the government. How, I'm going to use the word afraid, how afraid are people at the upper reaches of the government of these networks? Well, worried, I would say. They're worried. Afraid is not, I mean, we weren't afraid of them. 
we were, you know, we just wanted to stay on top of them. Do you think it shapes American behavior? The fear that these, you know, the newspapers say, well, one of the reasons we're constrained is someone might pull the trigger on these sleeper cells. Mm -hmm. Well, they should worry about it a lot more than they do, frankly, because newspapers have a grand old time exposing the ways that the government knows about these networks, which makes it more difficult to stay on top of them and makes it easier for these networks to operate. Uh, let's go to the 2009 Iranian elections, uh, not because the elections themselves were or were not important, but because of what they seem to reveal either uh, what had already happened to Iranian government and society or what was in the process of happening. I think many people for the first time saw sites in Tehran that looked much reminiscent of Nazi Germany. I think I even saw black shirts. And it looked like yeah, thugs. Yeah, black. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it looked as if there were thugs in the streets mm. controlling you know, crowds of citizens. And this was, I think this was a new vision for the American public. Well, it shouldn't have been because it had been going on for a very long time. And the evidence both of the evil of the regime with regard to their own people and the contempt and hatred that the people hold for the regime had been evident for a long time. Accomplice to Evil is the third book I've written that is mostly or in large part about contemporary Iran. And I've made that point in all three books. Uh, and so have lots of other scholars, a lot of scholars who have done this. So the story's there. It isn't much reported in the daily press. For the same reason, you know, I have a, people often ask, why were, you know, why has the United States not been more vigorous in going after these people? And one of the reasons is that you know, once, once the community, the intelligence community and the law enforcement community, once they find that policymakers aren't going to do anything, they stop reporting. Because then it becomes bad for your career. If you say, hey, there are these terrorists over there and they're doing thus and such, and you know that the guy... Really? Militants. <laughs> yes. Right. I mean, I... It, Extremists. I, I could accept, by the way, that <laughs> phrase <coughs> for people who demonstrate in the streets. Mm -hmm. But how we've you now used that term for people who carry a bomb into a crowded restaurant... Right. Um, boggles my mind at least. Well that's what happens. You make all, the, it's part of this process. You, you make a whole series of accommodations. You, you, the language changes so that you can't call them by their proper name. You can't describe what's actually going on and so forth. And so you have to talk about, I mean, this Fort Hood incident, right? But people are bending over backwards not to say Islamic terrorist, jihadi. Mm -hmm. Those are the words that, uh, that describe that action as far as I can tell. They don't do it for the same reason that the guy in the counterterrorism center who comes across evidence that some plot is underway and there's this very dangerous group that we haven't noticed before. And all of a sudden, and, and they are here in the United States because he knows that if he tells his superiors, his superiors are going to get very angry at him and say, why are you telling me all this nonsense? What are you doing? And so he's going to mm -hmm. move further down the corridor away from the warm office. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's, that's what has happened over many years. It, it, this is not a feature of one administration or another. This has been going on for 30 years. I can't help but believe, and this, this, disagree with me if I've got this wrong, but I can't help but feel that um, in some respects um, the forces, forces of evil, the forces of tyranny in um, Iran have either become stronger or more visible. Uh, maybe it was just a patina of a guided democracy, of a theocratic, of a benign theocratic state. But I get the impression that over the years, corruption, power grabbing, uh, the importance of the revolutionary guards mm. as, a, as a, an enforcement mechanism, all that has grown as a form of either consolidated power, concentrated power, and then more tyranny. No, from the beginning? I think, it, <clears throat> I think you're right that, that people are more attentive to it. People are more anxious about it. And the reason for that is the nuclear program because mm -hmm. that gets a lot of people's attention. I mean, basically, people don't care. I mean, sp so suppose they kill a million Iranians a year, as the Italians say, right? Their problem. 
But the minute they start building atomic bombs and say, we're going to destroy Israel, we're going to destroy the United States, that tends to get people's attention. Well, let's leave the bomb for our next show because yeah. I really want to talk about it. Yeah. But, but I do want to pick up on what you've suggested now more than once, which is the failure of the U.S. administrations, um, both the Obama and before, to come to grips with um, not just the evil, but the intransigence, or maybe I should put it the other way around, but they keep knocking on the door, right, and no one answers. And um, No, it's worse. They knock on the door and the guy comes out and kicks them. <laughs> they kick them. They insult them. They, you know, get out of here. I mean, why should we deal with you? You know, there's this great scene in Goldfinger mm -hmm. where James Bond's lying on a sheet of gold and is handcuffed to it and his legs are spread and this laser beam is moving up towards his spread legs and he looks up and Goldfinger's up on a little back and he says do you expect me to talk and Goldfinger looks down and says no Mr. Bond I expect you to die and that's Iran I mean you want to talk they'll talk they're happy to talk Give, buys them time but they're not going to make any kind of rap rush moment so, so let me push you so peace-loving Obama administration, just to be outrageous about it, keeps trying. But the warmongering Bush administration mm. also kept. Yes. So They thought they'd made a deal, in fact. They thought they had me. a deal. They thought they had a deal in 2006. They, Condoleezza Rice and, and Nick Burns, had been negotiating with Ali Larajani, every, everybody's favorite Iranian negotiator. And they thought they had a deal, and it was all set up. That is, on a Monday, Larajani was going to fly to the UN. Rice, Burns, et al. were going to go up to New York. Larajani was going to say, we're stopping uranium en enrichment. And Condi was going to say, we're suspending sanctions. And that was the deal, and it was all agreed. And on the Friday before, the Iranians said, we need 300 extra visas. And these people, these poor people in Homeland Security, stayed up all weekend and issued 300 visas, believe it or not. And then, of course, Monday nobody ever came. Nobody showed up. And Burns hung around in New York for several days, waiting. So are they, the Nothing Iranians happened. just trying to run the clock out? Yes, they want to keep, you know, apparently they don't have nukes that go on missiles that can hit something. Yet. Yet. They're working on it. So the, they, they're just constantly buying time. So I heard something very wise in a different, co I thought it was very wise, in a different context. It was about the Chinese. And what it was is, in any negotiation with the Chinese, w we Americans are at a tremendous disadvantage. We hardly know them. We hardly understand them. And we're often, you know, sending amateurs to deal with them. And on the other side, these are people who've almost always been to the U.S., often have studied here, lived here. They understand us. We don't understand them. Is a similar thing happening with the Iranians? I don't believe that. Uh, I think that, in fact, tyrants, uh, including the best educated experts, advisors, diplomats in tyrannical countries, do not understand us and cannot understand us. And they are constantly surprised by us. I mean, I, my heart always went out to KGB people in Washington who were supposed to tell uh, you know, Soviet dictators, what the Americans were going to do next. And I said, we don't know what we're going to do next. How are they supposed to know? It's impossible. It's unknowable. I mean, we're too, we're, we're much too much a revolutionary society. And our ability to turn on a dime, which is both one of our great strengths and one of our great weaknesses, is something they cannot imagine. They but, can't imagine. But that's it. the only, I, I guess I want to push you here a little bit. Uh, I agree with you, and I think the Japanese made the same mistake in World War II. Oh, everybody, right. they all have. Our enemies have always saved us because they've made mistakes. But in the short term, it does feel a little bit like, I don't think it's necessarily rope the dope, you know, and Muhammad Ali, yeah. but it does feel as if they have figured out how to run this clock out, and it's one of these things where we, there's no obvious place where we can just put our foot down and say, that's it. Well, how about they're killing Americans every day? Isn't that good enough for us to put our foot down? I mean, it just... I think you should explain what you mean by that. <laughs> well, they, I mean, there's Iranians arrested every day in Iraq and Afghanistan. 
There's Iranian-supported killers in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, also arrested every day, arrested, killed, wounded, every single day. Well, the, it, was, it was George Bush who said, you know, anybody who harbors a terrorist, we're going to. This is, right. this is why I can't blame this on any one particular administration. No, I don't either. I mean, it's to, everybody's done it. They've all done it. Well, I introduced this show by saying this was a chilling book. It's a chilling book. It's a chilling discussion. Uh, when we come back, uh, I'd like to take this to the next step of understanding about uh, Iran's interest in the nuclear bomb and what it means for the future of not just the Middle East, but the U.S. and the rest of the world. But for now, Michael Ledeen, thank you very much for being on Policy Watch. And I hope you, I know you're coming back. Yeah, I'm coming back. Yeah. Thanks, Doug. And to our viewing audience, let me say thank you so much for watching this program. And if you have any questions or comments, it's policywatch at umd, umd for University of Maryland, dot edu. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you soon. This program was produced by the University of Maryland, which is solely responsible for its content. The Norman and Florence Brody Family Foundation is dedicated to exploring topics of national and international importance and is proud to support Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff at the University of Maryland. We are PBS.